Yeah, if there's ever silence on the show, just know something horrible is happening in the background. Like, if we're ever not talking, something is going wrong. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 38 of the Coconut Curry podcast. On this episode, we are going to continue our NFL division breakdowns, talking about the NFC North, and we are going to discuss U.S. Olympic men's basketball, because a lot of stuff has been released about that, interviews and stuff like that. It's very interesting to do, and we're also going to reveal how we would do the starting lineup for that team. But before we do all of that, we are just two postgraduate students from the University of Pittsburgh. Peter and myself are both on today. We were going to have a special guest on to talk about the lions today but like our previous two guests last week they also could not make it um our usual co-host raj is also out of commission today because he's busy moving into a new apartment so just two of us rolling today but we are excited to talk about football and we're two prof- professional yappers so um yes. there will be much to talk about we usually yeah, start kind of unbelievable raj couldn't come sorry to cut no, you yeah, off go ahead. it's almost like he's like moving into his apartment to like go to med school or yeah, something it's, it's ridiculous kind of not a big deal he? it's kind of not a big deal but yeah. like whatever um, like why couldn't he join it's ridiculous yeah, whatever it's crazy sorry. um but we usually start with reacting to comments but we have no comments but i did want to point out here if you are listening as far in the episode last week our podcast had a terrible showing six views on the main episode six views on the clips after following a 36 and 140 view segment so if you're listening please drop a comment like subscribe it helps us out a lot it boosts the video on the youtube algorithm we want more clicks we had one of our all-time best weeks two weeks ago this week coming up terrible week don't know what happened so make sure you're (laughs) liking commenting all that type of stuff and if you comment you might get featured on the podcast never know yeah never know but it's disgruntled moment of the week our favorite segment of the show disgruntled meaning dissatisfied or angry we discuss moments in the sports world or our personal life that make ourselves others dissatisfied or angry so peter i see what you have listed there let's talk about that Pittsburgh weather the h okay pittsburgh we we complain about this all the time pittsburgh weather just needs to pick a lane i just need to know what i need to prepare for two weeks ago 95 degrees every single day felt like 110 walking around it was ridiculous then the week after nice 80 to like set high 70s like good weather whatever back to the 90s (laughs) what are we doing we already had our we already had a heat wave we should be done with this no more i i'm so sick and tired of going outside and like literally going to sleep sweating waking up it's cold because i'm sweating and i'm cranking the ac and then i go outside and it's like only like low 60s so it's like okay i'll put a sweatshirt on whatever i have to bring that to work i step out of work coming home and it's like 110 degrees outside like what is this <laughs> like, the, the worst, come on the worst is when you walk into work with an extra layer on and you leave work and it's just boiling hot yeah and you just you already have that extra layer on because they're cranking the ac in there you're in there for eight hours so you start getting cold and you walk out thinking like okay like i'll take it off eventually and then it's just oh what is happening every day during the yeah. summer i'd either wear like my patagonia over my scrubs or a yeah. clinic over my scrubs and then you you walk out and you're like well i can't wear this anymore because and you think sometimes you think for a moment like you walk into the bus stop you'll be like i'll just keep the crew neck on it's not worth taking it off putting it in the bag and whatever i'll deal with it but then it's 95 and 80 percent humidity and you're like no absolutely yeah not. yeah and then you're like standing in the direct sunlight at the bus stop and you're like I'm regretting this yep. very much. <laughs> but, but your pride tells you not to take it off. <laughs> like, come on. I don't want to look weird. I don't want to, like, have to awkwardly take my sweatshirt off and then sort of pull my scrubs up with it. I look like a freak on the side. <laughs> it's brutal. Um, I have another really weather-related is. thing for my first disgruntled. Oh, perfect. My second one. Um, Whoa. Humidity is just so, <laughs> like, everywhere. I, I thought this was, like, a New Jersey thing. I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm on vacation right now in the Outer Banks. And on Friday, before we came down on Saturday... I went on a run really late at night because it was like 90% humidity, 90 degrees outside. It's going to be brutal. So I tried to wait as late as possible. The run still sucked. I was sweaty the whole entire time. It was so hot. But I was like, thank God. We're going to go to the beach for a week. The wind will be going. It'll be great. No, not at all. I've been on two runs since I've been down here dripping, just dripping and overheated both times. It's been so incredibly humid for no reason. And I'm just pissed off about it. Like, I can deal with a certain sense of like 95 and sunny, but the humidity is low. 
when you can't yes. even get the sweat to get off your body because it is just so wet outside, just the, the absolute worst. So it, it, when it's just like you get out and it's just like a soup, yep. it's like the air is just like thick and you can't even tell if you're sweating or if it's the humidity just like sticking to you and you could never get cool ever because then like the water is like hot in the air. Oh my God, mm. it's terrible. And down at the beach, the weather broke a little bit today. We had a little bit of rain. The wind came in. It was good. But good. like, because we're so close to the water, the weather isn't changing. Like the high for today was 82. The low for today is 80. So there's no fluctuation. It's just like <laughs> constantly the same heat, which that's a good temperature. But if it's not, but the humidity has gone down a little bit. If it's 90% humidity and it's 82, you're just dripping. It's miserable. Yeah. It's horrible. Oh my God. That is brutal. Yeah. My second disgruntled moment of the week is I'm, I'm going to fill in here for Raj. The Sacramento Kings, we weren't, it wasn't going to make the mainline <laughs> podcast. I'd talk about it. Um, they signed DeMar DeRozan to a three-year, $70 million deal, whatever. It's not really about the dollar figure. It's about the fact that teams don't learn that signing players to your team that don't make sense is not a good decision. It happens all yeah. the time. And every single time, every single sports fan in America can go, I don't really understand how it's going to work. And then the issue, there's immediately trouble. Everyone's like, yeah, we said it wasn't going to work. It happened with Bradley Beal. It's happened with others. It happened with the Brooklyn Nets. We, we just talked about this in the last podcast episode when we talked about um, Joel Embiid, Paul George, and uh, Tyrese Maxey, how they all fit and how they all make sense on a basketball team and all have roles. I have no idea what DeMar DeRozan's role is on this team. The point guard, the best player for the Sacramento Kings, is a point guard who does not have a great three-point shot who takes a lot of mid-range shots and likes to get to the rim. The player they just signed likes to take a bunch of mid-range shots, is an ISO ball yeah. dominant guy, does not shoot the three ball well, go through the rest of the roster. What are they not great at? Defending. What was the one player they didn't add? DeMar DeRozan is not a defender. Um, he could have <laughs> gone everywhere. Like They have size issues. DeMontis Sabonis is a power forward playing center right now because a little bit more small ball. They didn't sign a big guy to fix that issue. Um, they didn't sign a three and D guy to play shooting guard to help with their spacing and help with their defending. They signed a old ball dominant forward to a $25 million deal to probably start for a team that makes no sense. Like a starting lineup of, I'm trying to rack the Kings roster, my brain real quick, but let me just like rip off the tongue. Darren Fox. Malik Monk is back there. I think. Um, well, then DeMar DeRozan. DeMar DeRozan, Harrison Barnes, and DeMontis Sabonis. So I I just don't understand. Like, you just don't have to sign the player. Like, DeMar DeRozan's yeah. out there. No one's signing him to a deal. Cool. You don't have to be the team that's like, you know what? He, DeMar DeRozan's a good player, so we'll just add him because he's, he's a good player. Like, if he comes off the bench for them, great. But nobody pays $25 million for a bench player. So yeah. I just like I'm I'm disgruntled because I'm watching NBA front offices make the same mistake all the time. I understand the Kings were sh like really going to be hard pressed to find ways to make this team much better. I'm sorry, I forgot Keegan Murray. Keegan Murray will play power forward. There we go. So, um, but that's like Demontis Sabonis, Keegan Murray. You could play Harrison Brown, Harrison Barnes, or um, or Demar Derozan. But again, like, is, are you going to put 25 million dollar Demar Derozan on the bench? Yeah, like, are you paying $25 million for a sixth man? And if you are, then you're probably poorly run because you don't need to pay $25 million for a sixth man. So then I'm more disgruntled that you paid $25 million for a sixth man. So I'm disgruntled that you paid for a, for a player that was unnecessary. Or I could be disgruntled that you paid more money for a sixth man. So anyway, the Kings are just pissing me off. Like, I saw that report and I was like, <laughs> that it just absolutely it made no sense to me. I put it in our group chat. I said it might be one of the worst signings of all time. And someone was like, <laughs> and then someone was like, one of our friends was saying that, oh, I don't know about that. That might be a stretch. I promise you that when the season's over, we're going to all be like, oh, the Kings missed the playoffs. And didn't they, they signed DeMar DeRozan this year. That didn't really work out, right? He like averaged 10 points on like 40% shooting and the team never seemed to work out well. And I'm going to be saying, I'm gonna come back <laughs> on this podcast in, in 10 months time and be like, I told you so. Um, but that, that's, <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah. That's the disgruntled moment of the week. Um, our favorite segment is always love having Raj on for the yes. for this segment, but uh, couldn't make it today. So stay tuned for next week. Yes.
But now we're going to move into NFL division breakdowns. This is a segment that we started last week where we're going to go through all eight NFL divisions. We started last week with the NFC East. If you like that content, you can go to our last week video. We have chapters for each team we broke down. If you want to listen to your favorite team, you can also go listen to our separate clip that we posted about talking about the why the Eagles should be NFC favorites to go to the Super Bowl. Um, today we are doing the NFC North. What I think, Peter, is probably the most interesting division in yeah. football for this upcoming year. I know a lot of people will say it's the AFC North that they have a good contention for that, but I truly believe the NFC North has some of the most stacked talent and interesting storylines going into the season. Absolutely. I I do I I agree with you. I think it's the most interesting because I feel like for a while we've known that the AFC North is probably the most competitive division for like a very long time. Like they have the black and blue division forever. They just beat the crap out of each other. But the NFC North has like basically been in our lifetime just run by the Packers. Like there's been like every so often that like the Vikings or the Bears might sneak their way in sort of thing. But other than that, nothing really going on there. It was just Packers dominating. But then all of a sudden the Lions just took over the division for about three months and then the Packers also got really good. And then the Bears in the offseason were like, oh, we're actually s- trying to support Caleb Williams. So we invested like a billion dollars into yep. this offseason because we and had the gap new, space. And a new stadium. And a new stadium. And then the Vikings are just there like, we got a good receiver room. Uh, J.J. McCarthy is like barely making the team. Uh yeah, <laughs> but I think it's just it's it is it absolutely is going to be the most interesting division. Yeah, I, we were talking before the podcast. We think I can make a case for every team why they make the playoffs and go on a past round one playoff run. Because um, even yeah. teams that when we'll get into like the Vikings, where I think they might have the slimmest chance. I really love their quarter. They could. I really like. I really love if they their turn their positions. defense around. Like they got Justin Jefferson, they got Jordan Addison, they got T.J. Hawkinson. Aaron like Jones. these are good players. Aaron Jones. Like, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. So um, we're going to start with the Green Bay Packers, a team that last year yes. kind of wasn't on anybody's horizon. It's the first year without Aaron nope. Rodgers. Jordan Love comes in, and they create one of the biggest upsets in all of playoff history. You know, the Cowboys were a good team last year. Um, and as the seven seed, they come in and whack the Cowboys and then, Mm -hmm. I mean, whacked them. And then they were a Jordan love Brett Favre mind slip away from beating the 49ers. There were a lot of things in that 49ers game that could have tilted the Packers way. It didn't, um, they end up losing the game, but they were fractions away from making it to the NFC championship game. And now they come into next year, their wide receiver room was young. Their quarterback was the first year starting. There's a lot to look for forward to for the Green Bay Packers yeah. this year. And they also added a ton of talent in the offseason. I don't particularly know why they chose uh, Brandon Jacobs over – or not Brandon Jacobs. Jesus, that's the Giants running back. My <laughs> God. <laughs> Josh Jacobs over um, Aaron Jones, but it – they, they did, yeah. and I mean, hey, he's also a very good running back, so okay, they got him on a cheaper deal, I think. Uh, but then, really, I think what was in, what their most important move of the offseason was adding Xavier McKinney from the New York Giants, uh, bolstering up that secondary. They really needed help safety-wise, and I think Xavier McKinney is going to look incredible in that defense because they have Jair Alexander, because they have a lot of young talent uh, on the other corner positions. They really need kind of another anchor in that secondary, and Xavier McKinney is exactly that. He's a very consistent, like, ball hawk kind of guy, free safety. Um, So that was kind of the one thing that the Packers were, like, a little bit worried about, was like, oh, well, our, our defense is, like, kind of what we're relying on while we're trying to build up this young offensive core. So adding him was great, but I mean, look, the lions are going to have some problems with Jordan love because he looks legit. Yeah. Like very, very legit, which is a shocker considering, you know, Oh, who would have thought sitting your quarterback behind a hall of famer is actually going to be a good thing. So that way he can learn. Certainly haven't seen this from the green Bay Packers before. No, it's impossible. Never sit your quarterbacks ever. Put them in immediately and let them suffer. <laughs> um, I particularly like what the Packers did this offseason because they get 
Jordan Morgan, which again, some of these players in the later first round, second round, you never know how they're going to turn out. But for the Packers, improving upon the offensive line, just making that commitment to um, Jordan Love. Obviously, David Bakhtiari retired. Um, so that was a big hit. Well, I don't know if he retired. I think he's still like technically a free agent okay. at this point, but like he's just not yeah. playing for the Packers. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like whatever. He, he's cooked, but you know, getting a good right guard <laughs> in there, right tackle in there to play for you is, is a big deal. Um, I agree a hundred percent. The Xavier McKinney was like, they, they have question marks in the defense and we can get into that a little bit, but that is mm-hmm. a big boost to the secondary who needed it. Um, Again, you got Jair Alexander there, which Jair Alexander is very good. They drafted Edron Cooper, who's one of the most like freakish linebackers coming out of yeah. uh, college. So like he's really raw and like whatnot. But if he can like kind of develop into that player, they already have mm-hmm. Quay Walker, who's been good at the linebacker position. They have a good linebacker core, um, and you can go from there. My biggest concern with them is: do they have enough top end skill position? Like. <laughs> Yeah, I like Christian Watson. I like Romeo Dobbs. I like Jaden Reed, but are they collectively a good going to be a good enough wide receiver combo going into the year? Because you've got Amon Ross St. Brown in your division. You have Jordan Addison and Justin Jefferson in your division. You have Keenan Allen, Romeo Dobbs, and um, DJ Moore. DJ Moore in your division. So, is that enough to carry you over the top? I don't know because Christian Watson was injured a lot last year. Didn't have a chance to develop um, yeah. in the second year. So I'm very curious to watch that wide receiver core because Christian Watson can be a one B type of guy. And if he's one B Romeo Dobbs is a two, then suddenly you've yeah. got something cooking there. So like, that's where my eyes are at for the season. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really good point because like, I think one of those receivers on the team kind of needs to pull away as the true number one. Like that's really what they kind of, so that way they can at least organize it. So it's like, okay, we have a one, two and a three. Like we know where we're going to be going with each of them. It's not kind of just like a cluster. And then they're just like, Oh, we kind of just go wherever. I think one of them really needs to separate themselves. I think it's going to be Romeo Dobbs just because of how well he's been playing. And like, he was very consistent towards the end of the end of the season. Of course, Christian Watson, if he stays healthy, he's already proven that he could definitely be a number one. It just kind of exactly like he he really is. And actually, interestingly enough, the uh, this past offseason, he has like done some I think some testing on his hamstrings because that was like what was injuring him. And he actually found out that his one hamstring is like shorter than the other. And then was doing, yeah. And then he ended up doing like a ton of, he's like doing a ton of different exercises to like strengthen the shorter one. So that way it can keep up with the other one. So like he legitimately might have like figured out why so many people get hamstring injuries. So, Hey, if this dude just cooked yeah, good for him, man. Yeah. Lena, I mean, kids, a, he's a barn burner. So like if you, if you start figuring out those hamstring injuries, you can take the top off of defense. Uh, yeah leave guys like Jaden Reed and Romeo Dobbs open underneath. Um, I like the Josh Jacobs signing because Aaron Jones is not necessarily as much of a like first down back, get you three, four yards. Mm-hmm. Josh Jacobs is. Yep. So I think they can kind of work that into their offense a little bit more where it's like, okay, Josh, we're not expecting as much from you out the backfield um, as a receiver, but on mm-hmm. first down, we need you to consistently get three, four yards to set us up in a short field situation. So I do like that for them. Um, they also have just like some talented guys on defense that uh, don't get talked about a lot. Uh, Rashawn Gary's there. Lucas Van Ness was a first round pick last year. Yes. Um, so I do think there's a lot of room for improvement in this team. The question's just going to be, do they have enough room? Like, can, can they yeah. grow enough? Cause their roster is not as talented as, and we'll get into it. The lions roster, but can they improve to be so I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think they have a very high ceiling, but they just haven't, like, because they're obviously, like, you could see them, like, creeping up towards that ceiling of, like, okay, well, if every single one of these players continues to develop at the pace that they're going at, this team's going to be terrifying. But that's accounting for nothing going wrong, everybody developing properly. Like, it's, there's a lot of different variables that we need to see. And, I'm really excited to watch them and see if that does end up working out. But again, only time will tell. Yeah. I'm looking at their schedule. It doesn't seem too 
it does look, it's hard to tell if it's difficult or not. There's a lot of good teams in the NFL. Um, Mm -hmm. but the big question is, let's, it starts and ends with the quarterback. Does Jordan love improve upon what he did last year? Yeah, that's really, yeah. The, this team lives and dies by Jordan love. And cause when he doesn't have a good game, they will lose. Cause I mean, look what happened against the giants. Tommy DeVito came in there and beat them. That's not supposed to happen. No. They beat the crap out of the Cowboys in the playoffs. What's <laughs> happening here? Like, it's just, it really is like, if if teams could figure out Jordan Love, they're beating this team, period. Mm-hmm. End of story. But if Jordan Love can continue on said trajectory and become Aaron Rodgers too, they, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody told me they were like winning a Super Bowl in the next like five, six years. Yeah. Wouldn't be surprised. I I think Jordan Love is going to have the most interesting season. I'm not really making any crazy predictions because I could see him kind of coming back to earth a little bit. And mm-hmm. I could also see them him just blasting off and having an MVP type caliber a year. Like it's yep. really going to be on him. You could argue. I don't think you could even argue. He's probably the best quarterback in the division. Um, I honestly, yeah, I would at this point in time, I absolutely would say that Jordan Love is probably the best quarterback in the division. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you're looking at Sam Darnold slash JJ McCarthy, Caleb Williams again, rookie, two rookies there. Um, yeah. Then you're looking at Jared Goff, who is good but not much more than good, and mm-hmm. then that's it. And then you yeah, got, uh, Jordan Love. So. Best quarterback in the division, but we'll have to see if he can keep that improvement going into the year. Um, the Vegas win total is okay. set at nine and a half wins for the Packers. Damn it. That's a, oh, that's tough. And as we're doing it with all of these, we're not making official predictions in terms of how many yeah. wins, but we will make a full and completed schedule prediction when we get closer to the season right now. We're just giving first impressions based on lines. Peter, what are you giving the over? Give me the over. Okay. Yeah. I believe in Jordan love. I, although I was gassing up the roster a little bit, I'm going to take the under. I think, I think the Packers might be in for a little bit of a rude awakening this year. They have a tough, they have a tough division. It's going to be extremely hard for them to even go three and three in the division. Um, you're probably getting at least one loss to the Lions. You're getting another loss guaranteed between the Bears and the um, Vikings. Vikings. So then it's like, okay, do you do you lose two to the Lions? Could you lose another one to there? I think they're mm-hmm. like kind of bound for three losses in the division. They start the season with the Eagles, which is a really tough way to start. The oh, that's season. in Brazil too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then they play, I think, the 49ers at some point this year. Um, just pulling up the schedule real quick. They play the Texans. They play the 49ers, the Dolphins. Um, they got the Seahawks on the road. Um, mm. So I think it could be tough. They end two games of the season. They end. They end with the they end with on the road at the Vikings and home against the Bears. Those two games. Oh, those are huge. Oh, my God. Like, I can already tell from far. Those two games are going to matter for playoff seeding and and mm-hmm. possibly division winners. Yeah. Here. Um, those are those are two massive ga- games for them. They play the Colts at one point in the year. Ravens. Like, I just think, I think they're going to be in a little bit of a rude awakening. Their offensive line is not as strong as I would like for a team. Um, that still That's has fair. a young quarterback there. So I'm going to go with the under, put them at eight or nine wins. It's just a tough, di- I mean, it's a tough division. You don't have any free, no free teams. Yeah. You, you don't say. get any wiggle room. Yeah. You don't, you don't have any teams where you're like, Oh, yep. They'll pick two off. Like when you talk about the, when we talked about last week, NFC East Eagles commanders, <laughs> like, yeah, Eagles probably get two games off the commanders, you know? Um, We'll talk about. I don't know. The Commanders always play ridiculously good, they, only they against the Eagles, though. They do. 49ers <laughs> get two wins off the Cardinals. Like those, those feel guaranteed. Yeah. There's yeah. no. You're not getting two wins off any team in your division. Um, it's yeah. Easy in the NFC, NFC North. So, mm-hmm. I'm very. I think this is like the mu- the must watch team though, and they're going to be coming off with a lot of like hype and momentum from last year. It's like 
they almost beat the Super Bowl, the team that came in second this year, yeah. who played in overtime and lost to a historically great quarterback and coach combo. And yeah. that, that team almost beat them in round two of the playoffs. So yeah. I'm excited to see what they have nonetheless. I'm super excited for the Packers Eagles Brazil game. Um, I think I told Oh my you, God. It's going to be insane. Side note I think like the the Eagles are the team that completely disappointed last year after falling off a cliff with some injuries and just coaching or feel like they're on a redemption tour to start the year. And they have a super talented roster going against a Packers squad that is um, young, who had a great season last year, defied expectations. And then they're playing in Brazil to start the year. Like, Also, why did they pick the two teams that wear green I know. <laughs> to go to Brazil? It's the dumbest it's thing so ever. Dumb. Um, anyway. <laughs> but... I, I think it's a great start. I also think it's going to be stress out fan bases. I think if the Packers lose that game, it's like, oh no, we're cooked. We're screwed. Last, last we're year, gonna. Last year was an anon- anomaly, and then all of a sudden, if the Eagles lose, it's like Kellen Moore, Vic Fangio <laughs> hit the they, panic they, button. They didn't fix the team. Nick Sirianni, he sent Saquon go. to the Gulag. <laughs> um, like it stresses me out as an Eagles fan. Kind of like, oh god, if we lose to the Packers in Week One, we're we're toast. <laughs> we're done. But that's the Green Bay Packers. Peter, any other further notes on the Packers? <laughs> no, I'm just – I can't wait to watch this team. It's going to be so much fun because it's – either way, because Packers fans are either insufferable or the nicest people you've ever met, and I can't wait to see what they end up saying about this team. <laughs> yep, I agree. All right. I think – you can make the argument this team is the most must-watch team going into the the season. I think Packers are a good contender. After you just said that the Packers were the most <laughs> were the <laughs> must-watch team, yes. the Chicago Bears have made some of the most drastic off-season changes after going seven and ten last year, and yeah. I think it's the next first exciting year. Um, they of course draft Caleb Williams number one overall. They draft Roma Dunze with the ninth pick question mark. Um, yes, in the draft, and they get Keenan Allen in free agency to add to DJ Moore. Um, they have some young guys coming back from last year. They, of course, got Montez Sweat last year at the trade deadline, who was a like come on demon time for the end of yeah. the season last year, and just a team that I feel like has the sudden like influx of talent after already going seven and ten last year, and there are a lot, a lot of people's like, oh, like they're like dark horse can they get to the playoffs and i think it's really possible for this team i again i think this like like you said about jordan love this team really hinges on caleb williams being that generational talent and coming in and playing like it because there's i don't think i've ever seen a rookie quarterback come in into like a plug and play situation with a better setup no like he has dj moore Keenan Allen, Roma Dunze, DeAndre Swift, multiple first round offensive linemen that were drafted. He then on defense has a, a pretty solid defense overall. I mean, Jalen Johnson is probably the most underrated corner in the league. Yeah, he He's like season. borderline top five. Yep. Like he has been insane. Then they got, uh, they stole the guy from uh, the Eagles, uh, TJ Edwards, Edwards yep. I think. TJ Edwards has been. Yeah, Termaine Edmonds. Yeah, like just some solid guys overall. So it's like, look, this team has talent. There is no excuse nope. whatsoever. There's no like, oh, he didn't have any help. Oh, he like just wait a couple years. It's like, no, like the Bears want to win now. Yep. And they put all of their chips in Caleb Williams. They're like, all right, cook, figure it out. And, they have- and if he if he doesn't do that, they're screwed. Yeah, and they have no backup court. Like it's not like there's a quarterback controversy oh no if he struggles a little bit early do you just put another guy nope they have tyson back badgett and uh brett ripen next to him so he's he's got the starting quarterback job on day one obviously we feel as if um his quarterback should sit for a year but that's not the approach that the bears went for um Mm -hmm. like you said they've got a system set up that i it's hard to see caleb williams for me not succeeding here i'm they I don't know if there's a better three wide receiver core in the league than what the Bears have. Uh, you could argue maybe the Texans after they added Stefan Diggs, but like 
having the consistency of players like DJ Moore and Keenan Allen. Granted, Keenan Allen does struggle with injuries sometimes, but if Roma Dunze ends up actually playing like a number nine overall pick in that receiver room, when DJ Moore just came off of like a 1400 yard season and Keenan Allen's one of the most like, Oh, just throw him the ball. He's going to catch it. Like he's got like sticky hands yeah. kind of guy. It's like, what? Like that's incredible. D- like that room is ridiculous. Moore is like the best second receiver on almost any team aside from like the Eagles and the Vikings and or and yeah. maybe the 49ers and then Roma Dunze is projected out to be a complete stud at, as a number one receiver option and like you mm-hmm. said about Keenan Allen guy who's always open always gets above thousand yard seasons and his only question mark is if he stays healthy I mean like just a fantastic wide receiver room um, oh and Cole Komet yep, tight end yep, exactly. very solid as well yep and <laughs> they, forgot about and him and then they have Gerald Everett being their backup which is He's an experienced tight end veteran, like in that position there. And they've got Darnell Wright, yeah. who they drafted in the first round two years ago. He's coming back. He's going to be even better. And the rest of their mm-hmm. team, like they've they've made some changes. They draft they traded for Ryan Bates uh, to be their center for their team. They signed Nate mm-hmm. Davis from Tennessee. Like they just they, they've been adding this talent here. The only question mark for their team is. I think their offensive line could lose a little bit of improvement. I think it's fine, but it could use a little bit of improvement. Mm-hmm. And some spots on their defense. I'm not saying they're a Super Bowl roster, but they I would I couldn't be shocked if they just start like destroying teams on offense because if Caleb Williams can get those guys the ball, who's who's the like same? why not? Like cuz we've seen like these kind of talents come in to do exactly that. I mean, you look at a guy kind of like I mean, I would say I would say Trevor Lawrence, but he, he went into a horrible situation. I would say Joe Burrow, but he immediately got hurt his first yeah. season. <laughs> but you have seen these guys kind of come in at like very early on in their careers and just start lighting it up. Yeah. Like, and I don't again, like I don't think I've seen a better situation for a rookie quarterback ever. No, <laughs> like for, for as horrible as the Bears front office has been for a while now, this I feel like is. Like they did a very good job, so hats off to your Bears. You did it. You finally had a good setup for a quarterback. You failed Justin Fields completely, but utterly, like, you did it. If I was Fields, I'd be so pissed. Like <laughs> I'd be so mad. I'd be like, are you serious? Like you, you went and got everyone as soon as I left. Like the second he, they, they're like, yeah, we're not bringing you back, and they're like, okay, we're not bringing him back anyway. Uh, Keenan Allen, uh, DeAndre Swift, uh, who Roma else are we getting? Roma Dunze. Roma Dunze. Like he's like, where was this? Yep. I do appreciate on that note about the Bears front office. I do appreciate that they, they had the first overall pick. There was a little bit of a conversation if they trade it, what they would do with Beal. Yeah. And they said, here's what we're gonna do. We're going to draft the quarterback who's a generational talent and we're going to make sure he has the best wide receiver room arguably Mm -hmm. in the league and let him roll with that. And we're going to put some good tight ends on the team as safety blankets. We're going to get an experienced running back who's good. And that's what they did. And I give, I applaud them for that. And they took care of guys on the defense. They have a good, they have a solid defense. Um, We'll see if it can be good or great, but I just can't say enough about how scary if Caleb Williams can be a top 15 quarterback and just protect the ball and get it to a skill guys, it's going to be dangerous. And a, a guy yeah. whose jobs on the line this year is Matt Eberflus. Like they, yeah. they thought they might trade him last. We thought they might uh, get rid of him last year. Didn't happen. Mm-hmm. He's coming into a year. That's absolutely like he loses his job. if This team doesn't succeed this year. Oh, absolutely. He is immediately gone if this team does not perform even because like I could see the argument of like, oh, you know, they only win like eight or nine games, but like they look a lot better and like, oh, well, like the division is just really hard, whatever. Like I could see that argument for him to stay, but if they underperform at all from the year prior, like he's gone yep. because this is a vastly improved roster overall. Like, there is no excuse for him. And I'm going to pull it up real quick. The Bears have a favorable schedule from what I've looked at. We'll yeah. just run through some games here. They start the season with um, the Titans at home. 
They go on the road to Texans, Colts, Rams, Panthers, Jaguars, Commanders, Cardinals, Patriots, Packers, Vikings, Lions, 49ers, Vikings, Lions, Seahawks, Packers. So all the hard games I'm really reading off here are their division games. But they have games mm-hmm. against the Seahawks and the Cardinals and the Commanders, Jaguars, Panthers, Rams. We'll see how good they can be. Titans. So I could see them getting to seven wins without playing many of their divisional mm-hmm. guys. So, yeah, I think they're set up for a good year. And listen, I mean, if Caleb Williams can lead this team to even the playoffs, it's going to be huge for the city. Um, They're going to be making statues out of him year one if they if he takes them to the playoffs. I mean, this is with the notion that the Chicago, Chicago Bears have never had a relevant quarterback play for them. There's all these like, stats about ever. how they've never had a 4,000-yard yeah. passer and everything like that, and they finally got their guy. Yeah. So I, I'm finally. excited. What are your expectations for this team? You say end of the year comes, and you say, I have their season result in my hand, and I say, Peter, what would you define as success for this Chicago Bears season? What would you say? I would say, okay, if we're going like what I think, I think Bears fans should temper their expectations maybe just a little bit just because like there's probably going to be some growing pains at first because like everybody is basically new on this team. Like it is a whole new roster here. So early on it might be a little bit shaky or they might go into a little bit of a slump at some point. So I'm I'm not saying they're going to be like world beaters. They're not winning like 13, 14 games or anything like that. But I think a successful Chicago Bears season is a winning record and at least, like, fighting for a playoff spot, if not making the playoffs. Like, I'm talking, like, last couple games of the season, it's like they're either in the hunt and, like, just miss out, but they still had a winning record. And it's just like, hey, the division or the conference was just really good this year and you just kind of missed out. Or they sneak into, like, that seven or six spot. Yeah. I think that's a successful season yeah. for them. Any for any playoff appearance. To me, whether yawning, whether you get um, blown <laughs> out in the first round or whatnot is, is a success. I also think the Bears season should be considered a success if they only get to eight wins. If they win one more game than last year. It might seem like we made all these changes and what happened. But every year is different. Um, mm-hmm. Their schedule last year may have not been hard. I'm like looking through some wins. They played the Commanders. They won. They beat the Raiders. Um, They beat the Panthers last year. Uh, They beat the Cardinals last year. They beat the Falcons last year. Um, They played the Broncos once. Like, just some looking at some wins. So I wouldn't necessarily say you can just equate one for one. Like, they won seven games last year. They should win nine or ten games this year. But it all hinges. We kind of talked about this with the Commanders. It all hinges on... Is, does Caleb Williams look good? Yeah. If you win yeah, yeah, yeah. three games because your defense is trash, but you say Caleb Williams, Keenan Allen, Roma Dunze, they looked DJ great. Moore yeah. look fantastic. Cool. You can fix the defense, get a new head coach in there, like get a new defensive coordinator, yeah. sign some guys, whatever. But it all hinges on Caleb Williams. If Caleb Williams is Andrew Luck, they're set. You're set. Yeah, like if you can protect, because yeah, because if you get that generational talent coming in, and you you know, like, look, we're good, we're good for the next fifteen years. We know we have a quarterback as long as we protect him. Who cares about this season? Literally, who cares? Because you got fifteen more of them down the barrel. Like, we'll figure it out eventually. But I also think there's a chance to just go like eleven and six, and we're like, this yeah. team's awesome, right off rip. Yeah. So it'll be fun to see. I think Bears are like kind of, especially with Caleb Williams and their receiver core. Like Roma mm-hmm. Dunze, I sent a video in our group chat long ago. Seems like a super likable guy, like great in front of the camera. Oh, yeah. Like, oh my God. I want to see him. Succeed. His one, dude, his one interview, <laughs> the, the, the draft guys were asking the dumbest questions. They go, So do you think you could land an airplane if it was going to crash? And he's like, Absolutely not. We're all going <laughs> <Yeah>. down. <laughs> Like, that was the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but Caleb, I want to root for. Um, he's got a, he's had a lot of kind of hate in college, you know, with the Utah. Oh, yeah. oh he painted his nails. Oh, yeah. oh, my God. 
So I I think it's a rootable team. I'm excited. I'd love to see oh, Keenan yeah. Allen succeed. I'd love to see Roma Dunze succeed. I'd love to see Caleb Williams. So I'm excited. Um, and DeAndre Swift's an Eagles guy. So um, yeah. all good things there. The Vegas win total, Peter. Just try to guess what the win total is at. Is that like seven and a half? Is that eight and a half? Eight and a half. Damn it. Do you I go was, over? I was, thinking, I was between the two. Are you going over or under that? I'll go over. Okay. I'll go over. I'll go, Seven and a half, I feel like, is a good line. Yeah, I'm going I'm going over uh two with that, I think. I think they can get to nine wins. It's just question is is nine and eight gonna get you in the playoffs? Exactly. Exactly. It, it remains. We don't know. Seen. We'll have to play the games. I think Bears fans, if you're listening in this podcast, do not panic if you lose the yeah. first game of the season to the Titans. It will suck. Do not. It'll yeah. suck. But this is a brand new team. Caleb Williams first start at home. Um, yeah. It's like, it's a, it's a lot of pressure. Um, but I could see that being like a, their first couple of games are like, they have five games to start of the year. Titans, Texans, Colts, Rams, Panthers. They can go three and two. They could go four and one in that stretch. If they start off hot. Yeah. We might have something there, but it could also fall flat. Um, there's just a lot of yeah. good, there's a lot of good teams in the NFL right now, and a lot of reasons to pick guys, and you'll have to see how the sh- season shakes out. So, I do think them starting with the Titans though could be good to start their way. Like, so moving on to the Minnesota Vikings, a team that interesting, yeah. I mean, I think like their defense has been abysmal for yeah, I can't even recall how long. It's just been a terrible defense, um, but they have so many interest like they have the best receiver in the league in my opinion by like a, a pretty Absolutely. wide margin i tyreek hills too but i think he's i think justin jefferson has separated himself from tyreek um jordan addison who going into his third second year third year third second year second year yeah or yeah second year wait he went, yeah second yeah. year yeah, yeah, yeah um pit guy shout out pit hail to pit um he 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 did win the best wide receiver award when he was a pit. The Blitnikoff, yep. yeah. So everyone remember that. Um, but he's <laughs> arguably like one of the best number twos in the league if he improves upon last oh, yeah. year. And again, TJ Hawkinson, Aaron Jones, who they acquired in free agency. The question is it hinges on that quarterback position, like we've talked about with some other guys in this division. Sam Darnold returns. He's back. Yep. <laughs> It's Sam Darnold. It's JJ McCarthy, who reportedly has looked terrible. Um, <laughs> like that's what the team, that's what the offense for the Minnesota Vikings hinges on. And the defense yeah. is kind of like, hopefully they figured it out because I don't, unless I am mistaken, they didn't add that much talent in that position. Well, Aside- don't worry. They still have the legendary white safety Harrison Smith still playing there. <laughs> I don't know how long that dude. I feel like that dude has been on the Vikings for thirty years. Yeah, it's, <laughs> like, honestly, at this point, it's a little ridiculous. He's been there forever. But they, because they lost uh, Daniel Hunter in free agency, yeah. and I'm looking at who was by far their these, best defensive player. Absolutely, uh, they did draft they Dallas got, Turner, who was a great pick. They, at that spot, yes, absolutely great pick. I will say, I did, I did like that aggressive move. It was kind of similar, but. I don't think it's going to be as good previously as like the Houston Texans where they were like, oh, we got our quarterback and we got our edge rusher. I think this is going to be kind of like the Walmart version of that, but I still like the move. But um, yeah, I'm looking at this team. I mean, they, they traded for some people. I mean, they have like they have like Harrison Phillips who came over from Buffalo. They have Andrew Van Genkel who came over from Miami linebacker, but like, they got Dallas Turner on the edge, but uh, I don't know. They got not really any big names in this team. Like, yeah, uh, they got Jihad Ward who played on the Giants for a little bit, <laughs> like, but that's really about it. Yeah, they have, like, they have Lewis Seen who they drafted a few years ago, Andrew yeah. Booth Jr. Um, yeah. Oh, they do have Jonathan Grenard. They did get from Houston in a strange like. Both teams signed players at the same position that kind of just felt like a trade, but didn't. Yep. Um, he was a good. He was really good for Houston as a like an edge rusher. So maybe they got him and Dallas Turner kind of on the other side. So they kind of got some edge rushers, but like other than that, 
don't really know. Yeah, their defense is is a work in progress, and I think for their offense, I I want to like it because I I like Justin Jefferson a lot. I obviously love Jordan Addison being a pit guy, and I yeah. want to see their quarterback room succeed. But I just don't see like their offensive line to me appears mediocre, maybe slightly below average, and mm-hmm. their defense is bad. So yeah, I don't, I don't know where the room for improvement on with this team is either. They haven't like made those trades. Like Dallas Turner is a great pickup, but is he going to be better than Daniel Hunter in year one? Unlikely. Daniel Hunter was really good. Yeah. Exactly. And then, like, at this point, it feels like you're wasting the Justin Jefferson contract because, like, you're paying him all this money. And then it's like, if you're not going to do anything, if you're not, if your team isn't set up for success, then, like, what what are we doing? Yep. So I'm curious to see where this team goes. How many games do you give Sam Darnold until JJ McCarthy gets to start? I think we're all under the impression right now it's going to be Sam Darnold to start, then JJ McCarthy at some point. Well, for the sake of J.J. McCarthy, I hope he doesn't see a single snap this season that isn't in garbage time. I hope he just completely sits this year and just cooks in the oven, and then eventually he'll come out a lot better. But I say realistically, probably by week. Depending on how bad the team is doing, I could see it as early as like week six, week seven. Uh, Probably more like a week 11 or 12 i'm guessing jj mccarthy might come out um but again it all just depends on how awful this team is yeah it's just it's a shame because i i really don't want to be negative on the vikings because again i mentioned i like some of their players but i just don't see it's them. hard not to because like they're sort of in a full rebuild but like they haven't touched their defense at all and like their rebuild was to get J.J. McCarthy, who's basically a glorified Brock Purdy. And then... And then you drafted him in the first that round. That was... Uh, yeah, you drafted him in the first round. And then, yes, they got Dallas Turner. And yes, they have Justin Jefferson. They have Jordan Addison. They have Aaron Jones. They have T.J. Hawkinson. Their offensive line is pretty solid. Christian Terrace is a really good uh, tackle there. But, like... Again, like this all hinges on somebody whose ceiling isn't that high. Yep. Because like unless, I don't know what what we were looking for. Unless here. it is. Unless Unless it is. And of course, again, I would love to be proven wrong by JJ McCarthy. I hope he succeeds. I hope he turns into the goat. Who cares? The but <laughs> is that gonna happen? I would put money on saying no. <laughs> but like it's just I don't I don't know what the the game plan was there yep. of drafting J.J. McCarthy round one when I don't think anybody else was going to draft him round one. I mean, I think teams like, would have, like, the reporting was like, well, the reason the Vikings draft him early is because other teams, of course, like, they wouldn't have drafted him if other teams didn't want him. And I agree with that. I think some other teams would have taken him. I think Denver would have loved him at the fall, but that doesn't just because another team's going to take them doesn't mean, like, I know it's hard. You needed a quarterback, but I have no doubt in my mind Sam Darnold's going to be – yeah, maybe I'm wrong. I, I just believe Sam Darnold's probably going to be the same quarterback J.J. McCarthy is in year one. So you could have just yeah done Sam Darnold, drafted a better defender to develop, and then been like, you know what? If we're trash, we're going to go draft a new guy in the next this next upcoming year. Um, or, like, is J.J. McCarthy really that much better than, like, somebody like Spencer Rattler? Like, at that point, like, yeah. if you got a project quarterback – like, why don't you pick him up later on and then, you know, not have to waste other draft picks? You could have just drafted Dallas Turner at that same position. Yep. I, I tend to agree. Peter, the Vikings start off their year. This is where the Sam Darnold, JJ McCarthy chat is okay. loud. Okay, okay, okay. Giants in week one, you know, a little division a uh, little wild card weekend. Uh, division rematch, yeah. yeah. Um then they got the 49ers, the Texans. Okay. The Packers, the Jets, and the Lions. That is their first six games. Oh, it's going to get loud in Minnesota. (laughs) Oh, boy. Um, You hope to split the division games. You're probably losing to the 49ers. Let's just give them the Giants win just for the sake of them. 
which is, would be but generous. that's one <laughs> which would be generous but that's one and they're going to be underdogs in all the rest of the games hoping to take truthfully hoping to take one of those five so you're looking best case scenario two and four. Oh god oh no minnesota <laughs> minnesota we oh have a problem. no oh god this is gonna be bad and i know this is gonna be really I bad people will say they they can't possibly have a harder schedule than they start with you're correct it doesn't it's not that bad the whole year but the problem is how you start dictates your starting quarterback what the team vibes are are you buying and selling at the deadline and everything yeah. like that and that's where it gets loud because this team is let's just call it two and five in their first seven games Even, and that's generous yeah, too if sam darnold is good it's still like well we're still yeah. two and five and if sam darnold's trash yeah. do you throw if jj's not good and sam darnold's trash do you just throw jj into the fire or do you continue yeah. to throw out sam darnold as like a sacrificial lamb or like <laughs> what what do you do yeah i don't oh god i'm really worried for them now i didn't realize their first couple games were that bad the giants is a good start you know it's gonna be a competitive game um, yeah yeah, yeah. they're edge. both like in like a rebuilding phase kind of thing so like they're at different positions obviously but like realistically that game is kind of like a toss-up like it could go either way and then the 49ers you're gonna be like nearly at probably worse than a touchdown underdog the Texans, yeah. like, they're really good. Probably another touchdown underdog there. Like, And the Packers on the road, and then the Jets are like, maybe you take one. The Jets could be, yeah, maybe you take one, but like like we were saying, like the Packers are going to look, they could look really good. And if the Jets, if Aaron Rodgers' Achilles well, doesn't explode again, even if they his, could be really good. Even if his Achilles doesn't explode, you got to go against Sauce Gardner and some of those the people on that defense with yeah, a, that's a good either a rookie quarterback or Sam Darnold. Like the strength of your team is your offense. Yeah, the Jets have a strength of defense, and your defense is trash. Well, they might have Aaron Rodgers and um, a much improved. Even God forbid they have Tyrod Taylor back there. Yeah. He'll he'll squeak out a win. Yeah. They got they got some decent skill position guys. <laughs> Better than decent. So I could get loud in Minnesota quick, man. Um, <laughs> and I would like to say, like, some of these other teams have been, like, it hinges on the quarterback. It hinges on the quarterback. If the quarterback is good, it doesn't matter how the season goes. No, because I don't know if people think, like, J.J. McCarthy needs to play this year and be good for this team. Yeah. I know, like, like if, he, if he doesn't just sit the entire year, he needs to be good. Yes. Like, period. He, like, he does. He's an older quarterback. He's yeah. um, been projected as uh, maybe he's not good. Um but why is everyone very like low him? ceiling? Yeah. Much more of like a distributor kind of guy versus like a guy that like wins you games. But they're like, yeah, well, we like this guy. He's got national championship pedigree. He's got he wins. Yeah, he wins. Okay, what what does that even mean? But, He's on a good team. Yeah, but like, like how how does Kevin O'Connell navigate a quarterback that just gets wins, just gets the ball to his guys, while also preserving him and letting him develop in the NFL? I don't know the answer because. Sam Darnold yeah. is like the worst guy to brought, bring in his position because Sam Darnold is like, <laughs> yeah, Sam Darnold is teetering the 32nd to 33rd best quarterback in the league. Line, yep. And that's probably where JJ is going to be in year one. So you just have two <laughs> identical quarterbacks playing, except <laughs> Sam Darnold's been in the league for five, six years. Oh God. So oh. I think it would have been a lot more clear if they had, I'm just going to throw out a name. I know he's retired. Ryan Fitzpatrick. Like where you're like, okay, this guy's got a th few games of magic in him. He's a good veteran, but we know he's not ever competing for the job with JJ McCarthy. Chase Daniels, professional yep. clipboard holder. Exactly. Um, there's a couple other of these guys around. Every Sam Darnold could be better than JJ McCarthy. JJ McCarthy. Just straight up. Straight he up. could just be better because like we have seen flashes of Sam Darnold actually be good. Yes. Like, this isn't unheard of in the NFL. Mm -mm. And, like, with a guy like Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison to throw to, who knows? Maybe he actually turns it on this time. And then you just got J.J. McCarthy sitting on the bench for five years. And you're just like, why did we draft him ninth overall? Yep. 
So JJ, I think JJ might have to play this year just to prove that he's like good. But at what point do you throw him in and does he succeed? And now you got Justin Jefferson you paid a bag to. Well, Justin Jefferson ha- hasn't had a quarterback or he has he had Kirk Cousins. Yeah. But he hasn't had a great team the last couple of years. You know, he wants to win. He's like the best receiver in the league. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, man, like I think they're in a sticky position. Vegas yeah. has them at seven and a half for their over under. I love the under in this case. Hammer the under, dude. Like the back half of their schedule does get a little bit easier, but like uh, again, that start is rough. Yeah, and like same thing with the Packers. I kind of talked about the Vikings ain't going, aren't getting any better than three and three in their division. Yeah, I don't think so. That's like that's really ge- for the Vikings yeah. especially. That's really generous to say they go three and three. Yeah, and I mean they've got other tough games in their schedule. You see the Colts here. They have the Rams, and we obviously talked about their challenging start to the year. The Falcons. Like, it's not a hard schedule, but they're also – I'm just i really concerned about the Not defense. a great team either. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm concerned about the defense, and can their quarterback play be enough? Because their quarterback room is probably – the worst in the yeah the their quarterback room is the worst in the division. No, no, Denver is worse. No, in, Denver in, in, in has to be worse. Oh, in division, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Denver's quarterback. I thought you were about to say the NFL. Denver's quarterback room is terrible. <laughs> it has to be Denver or the Raiders. The Raiders are really bad too. Oh yeah, we got AOC. Well, no, they got Gardner Minshew. He's fine. Is Gardner Minshew better than Sam Darnold? Uh yeah. I'd say so. I think dude, well he, JJ he was McCar- on the Colts. Okay, JJ McCarthy is better than AOC. Okay, JJ McCarthy's better than AOC, but that's why I said Denver, because we don't know what Bo Nix is. We have Zach Wilson who we, we know <laughs> is terrible. And then it's just somebody else who like some other poor sap that they pulled out the street to come play for him. At this rate, they're gonna be playing their wide receiver that was playing during COVID again. They're, they're, like, they're, they're third string quarterback, some track athlete who wants altitude training in Denver and is like literally who's just like, Hey, I'm just here for the for the free sideline tickets. Yep. Like I don't really know what's going on. What is football? What is football? Yeah, so exactly. we both, we both like, Sorry, Denver fans. <laughs> yeah. Also, with this division, like you look at the Lions right now, and obviously the Lions are going to have the highest line. Some teams going to have to be bad in the division. It's just like it's very unlikely. It has to be. All teams are over their win total for the year. Like it's unlikely mm-hmm. this team can get to eight and a half if the Bears go. The only concession is like, hey, I think the Vikings are going to get nine wins because the Bears are actually not going to have a good year. So. Um, yeah, I just think the Bears roster straight up. Their their defense is better than the Vikings, and their offense. They're not their wide. Res- their one two wide receiver aren't as good. Their one two three wide receiver are mm-hmm. close. And then, I Caleb Williams is better than the quarterbacks they have currently. Exactly. So we'll see. I think it's Ugh. I think it's tough times for Minnesota. Um, we'll I'll, we'll definitely see the rise of the Joe Biden clip where it's like. Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> One of my all-time favorites. Um, Who's the worst team in the league? Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> That's great. Moving on. Uh, this is we really want Mallory to join us in the podcast today. Unbelievable. Um, to talk about the Lions, but we're just gonna have to do it ourselves. The yeah, de- we're actually just gonna trash on the Lions now just because she didn't come on. Uh, they're not making the playoffs. Let's just be straight. First up. Yeah. round pick. I mean, not first round pick. First overall. <laughs> first pick. overall pick. They are taking a punter first overall. <laughs> uh, the Detroit Lions come off a fantastic year. A year they hope to make the playoffs Absolutely. and you know just build, and they end up going to the NFC Championship game. Have this. They were one and a half lead, away from the Super Bowl. Have this huge lead, and it all goes downhill, mainly off a ball that got hit a cornerback's re- <sighs> helmet and fell into the arms of, I think it was Brandon Ayuk. Um, yep. And now they are bound to go back this year and try to make it again. They have, I think, the fourth shortest odds to win the Super Bowl going into the year. They're... Win total is t- ten and a half. Um, yeah, we all know the expectations for this team. It's get to the Super Bowl. I wouldn't say if they lose the Super Bowl, it's a waste of a year. Because I really, th- I think you're right. Yeah, I, I think especially it being the Detroit Lions. Like, let's not get it twisted. Um, they've yeah. not been successful, and as an organization, so I think just getting to the big dance. And if they lose to a team like the Chiefs yeah. and the Bengals, who have been there before, it's not the end of the world. 
but they got to get at least to the NFC championship game. They were there last year. Bare minimum. Yeah. And they did not get any worse. No, because they did. They lost a couple guys uh, to, to free agency, but not guys that couldn't be replaced. Like specifically, I talked about this earlier, but um, they did lose CJ Gardner Johnson, but he was replaced with Brian Branch, who they drafted in the second round, who was an absolute steal at the nickel position. And I think like CJ Gardner Johnson was also hurt for part of uh, this past season. And then Brian Branch stepped up anyway. So it was kind of like, yeah, if you want to walk, that's fine. He's kind of going to take your position anyway. Cause I think he's going to end up being better than CJ Gardner Johnson. So they're not really too concerned there. Uh, their defense still looks very solid overall. I mean, obviously they have Aiden Hutchinson, who's looks like an I absolute thought. monster absolute stud there also just so happy that he's like a michigan guy in michigan yeah like so good for the city oh my god we love it they do have uh jack campbell at linebacker who started looking a lot better towards the end of the season um the one thing their corners are a little bit iffy um but of course they did just draft terry on arnold who i think probably had he's not as like athletically gifted as some of the other corners but like pure talent wise, like he is probably one of the most like fluid corners I've seen. Like somebody that he reminds me of, uh, not NFL wise, but like in college wise, he reminded me a lot of like Derek Stingley, who like just technique wise was just like perfect. Like he wasn't like this like huge like sauce gardener where he's just gonna lock you up, get in your face, whatever. It's just like I'm gonna stay in your back pocket and there's nothing you can do about yep. it. Like I'm gonna be here. And it's awesome to watch. So hopefully he'll be able to turn into a number one corner there and it'll work out for them. But, you know, it's kind of Super Bowl. Well, go to the Super Bowl or bust at this point. Yeah. Like, because if they don't, it's going to start to get a little bit loud because they're going to be like, oh, no, we suck again. We're, we're going backwards. And that's not what they need in Detroit. But and I... And that comes I have on, faith. And that comes on the back of you just gave Jared Goff a bag. A bag. So, and Amonra St. Brown and Penny Sewell yep. bag. So if you don't win in the next year or two, the bill comes due. And yep. and whatnot. I totally agree. I Terry and Arnold, like when I saw it, the Lions got him, I was like, that's a perfect pick. Terry and Arnold is mm -hmm. NFL ready. He's not raw at all. He's a developed, like, cornerback who's ready to play in big games. Obviously, he played in big games against Michigan last year and Georgia in the mm -hmm. SEC championship game. He's battle-tested. He's ready. And I think he's going to come in for this team, and he can be a cornerback one for a team that has had problems at the cornerback position. And that's still going to mm -hmm. be a weakness for them, the secondary. Um, but hopefully they can build on it throughout the year for their sake. Again, guys like Aiden Hutchinson, he's going to get better. Jack Campbell's going to get better. Carlton Davis they got um, from Tampa Bay. That, yeah. that will help. Um, they also got uh, DJ Reader from Cincinnati. Yep. Big defensive tackle. Going to be great in the run game. So those little improvements on the edges will help. Again, I think that will be a weak point. But let's turn to their offense, right? Jamison Williams didn't have a great year last year, but he's going to get better. I'm on Ross St. Brown. You can't defend him in short three, four, five-yard coverages. No. Um, they have... A dominant running back group with David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs. Jameer Gibbs coming into year two, probably get a little bit more of a workload. Their offensive line is a top five offensive line in football. You got Frank mm -hmm. Rag now there. Penny Sewell's a beast. So, and they're bringing back the same crew that they had last year. So, talk about continuity on that uh, on that situation. They also just replaced TJ Hawkinson with another TJ Hawkinson and Sam Laporta. And Sam La they were just like, oh, it's another Iowa tight end. Yeah, just draft him. And He'll Sam be good. And Sam Laporta's a stud. I mean, he was yeah. He was like one of the leading receivers in the tight end position last year um, as a rookie. So he comes in the next year. Yeah. So I like what they have on offense. I do question the wide receiver two position a little bit because it is Jamison Williams. Yeah. And, He's not the wide receiver two that Jordan Addison is or Keenan Allen slash DJ Moore slash Roma Dunze, whoever is wide receiver one, two or three yeah. out of that crew. Um, and I, he might even be, he's probably still a step below Romeo Dobbs um, or 
Christian Watson. Yeah, because the thing about Jamison Williams is like he's much of more of like a deep ball threat as opposed to like a true like number two receiver. Because like for those that don't know, there's like kind of different like styles of receiver in the NFL. You have like your X receiver, which is like kind of your bigger body can like do everything. That's like your Justin Jefferson. Your Y is going to be your slot receiver. And then, or no, I think Y is your deep threat, and then Z is a slot. Because so it just like it kind of just depends on like their style. And he is very much a Y receiver. He is a deep threat. Throw the ball down the field. He will go under it and catch it. But his route running isn't as great when it comes to like short distances. He's not going to be like a guy you can like really count on on like third down to go get like a contested catch. The thing is, and I'm, that's kind of Amon Rod's like a great slot receiver. He's like a slot receiver and a freaking wide receiver yes. one like workload type of guy. Exactly. Him and CD Lamb have kind of been changing the game where your number one receiver, which is normally always your X receiver is actually getting shifted into that slot position instead of uh, that uh, that outside. And he's incredible in the slot. Like, he is, like you said, unguardable in the, like, 10 yards. He's getting open, period. But I do wish they kind of beefed up their receiver room a little bit with somebody like a Keenan Allen, like a kind of a bigger body, a like Diggs. a good target. A Stefan Diggs, somebody that's like, okay, you know this guy's going to get open basically anywhere on the field. He can go get a contested catch. You don't really need to worry about it. Um, but that I do agree with you. The receiver room is a little bit shaky, even though Amon Ra is incredible. It's like this fall off is like pretty steep there, unless Jameson Williams can change his narrative real quick and stop gambling. But we'll ignore that. Yeah, I think the fortunate thing is the running back room is so good and so dynamic. Yeah, who they have yeah. back there that they can make up for a little bit of it. So, I think the Lions are in good position um, going into next year. The big thing also will be, first of all, it's always going to be quarterback Jared Goff. Can he be good and consistent, um, especially in games that are not in domes and outside? Like, can he, can he yeah. win those games? And then the other option is Dan Campbell, right? Great, he had yeah. a decent track record last year with making some big calls and risky decisions. He needs to do it for another year. And if they don't succeed this year, he, he's getting fired. Um, he made yeah. some near fireable offenses in, in route to losing the NFC championship game last year um, with going forward. And you bring him back because he had a great year. He's got the guys respect and everything, but this is his year. The Lions don't get to where they want to be. Dan Campbell will probably be fired. Um, so that's kind of like what they have on the horizon. Peter. Ten and a half wins is the Vegas line. Where are you going with that? Oh, that's tough. Ten and a half because I would if if it was nine and a half, I would easily hit the over on that. Uh, I feel like I've said over for every single team except the Vikings. Yeah, I'm still going to go over half. here. I like I, I'm looking at their schedule, man. Like it doesn't look hard to me. They start with the Rams. Yeah. Rams are, will always be tough, but they beat them in the playoffs last year. Um, they got okay. Bucks, Cardinals, Seahawks, Cowboys, Vikings, Titans, Packers, Texas, Jags, Colts. They have the Bills at some point. Like, Okay. Because a lot of those... You know what? Yeah. Yeah, I will go over on that. that. Because a lot of those teams, like, you know, they're like fine teams but like going up against the lions like they're going to lose yeah so yeah i like the over in ten and a half. yeah yeah i so you're going over on the packers who were at eight and a half i think going yes. over on the over bears, on the bears who were at seven and a half seven and a half no no they were at eight and a half too what? eight and a half and then under on the seven, vikings seven there was seven and a half and then over on the lions yeah and then i'm under over under over um yeah the division it's going to be shaping up to be a great division every game especially any it's going to be so game, entertaining it's going to be much oh. watch some really high powered offenses like detroit's fun to watch jameer gibbs i'm on raw much yeah. watch tv the bears are often going to be much must much watch uh justin jefferson's on the vikings like that's yeah. enough to bring a crowd in so watching jordan love just dice up defenses like that's going to be so entertaining yeah. like it's exciting. That's that. It really is. That's the NFC North. Any any further yeah. comments on the NFC North? I 
one thing I will say, uh, first of all, don't take our betting advice. But second of all, I don't bet on this division. We have no idea how they're going to turn out or who's going to beat who. Because each team is going to like split one game with the other, but we don't know how. And your mic died, didn't it? So that's that's all the NFL divisions. Um, not all the NFL divisions. All the teams in the NFC oh, North. Uh, we still got six more divisions to go. Again, if you like this segment, we're going to keep doing these for the next six weeks until we get to the end. And then we'll pretty much be in mid late August and football starts up September yeah. uh, 8th kind of weekend. So that's mm-hmm. what we're looking forward to. I wanted to end on team USA basketball because, Oh my Lord, I love the talent that's coming out of just talent and the media yeah. and everything that's coming out of USA basketball right now. All the interviews are fun. All the players, the select team, Cooper flag, all these type of things. So let's first start off with, I, I'll, we'll start off with Cooper flag because I think it's been like, the yeah. most exciting part, college basketball has notoriously been bad for the last couple of years. No one watches the draft. No one cares. March Madness is always cool, but like not as many big name players. A lot of them play overseas. You have France guys coming in. And Cooper Flagg, who is committed to Duke next year, is balling against the select team. I mean, as, as a member of select team playing against U- Team USA in scrimmages, all the interviews post game, LeBron and all these guys are like, Cooper Flagg is amazing. And it's so good for college basketball yeah yeah it's awesome because it's so cool to like see somebody he's like he's only like 18 right? like he is like very seven oh my god he is like 17 years old and watching like him go up for a layup on anthony davis have anthony davis swat it but then he catches it again and then goes back up into him for a rebound and then scores on Anthony Davis. Like, this isn't just some guy. And, like, yes, it's not, like, complete full speed, whatever. But, like, this is a 17-year-old going up against one of the better defenders in the NBA. And he is doing so well. And it's, like, it like what you were saying before, it's so cool to, like, hear these, like, veterans be like, yeah, honestly, the thing to take away, that kid's good. <laughs> like, yeah. That's what I like to see. Yeah, I mean, the guys in the USA team, and people are saying Cooper Flag was great. Bam Adebayo, first team all defense. Yeah. Joel Embiid would have been on on all defensive team if he was healthy throughout the year. AD, one of the better defenders in the league. Like, these guys are great defenders. Even guys that rotate in the small positions, Kawhi, like Jason Tatum. Like, the, these are really good basketball players, and Cooper Flag is yeah. playing well. And, um, I'm just really, really excited. I think this will create a lot of momentum going into that college basketball season. And all of a sudden, I heard Danny Parkin say it on uh, Colin Coward's show this week. He goes, hey, this is like going to be the uh, – it was the tank for this player type of movement. And he was like, it's going to be the capture the flag. Like, which team can get the first overall pick yeah. to get Cooper flag? And I think that's like a funny way of putting it. Like, um, oh, it was the suck for something. I forget, oh, I forget which player it was. But there's always suck for luck. Yeah, yeah, suck for luck for Andrew Luck in football, and it's gonna be a like capture the flag for Cooper yeah. Flag because yeah. yeah, that's not my bit. But um, I just thought it was a very interesting take on it. Love all the media coming out of that, and just everyone's talking about it. And that's cool. People are also talking about what should the starting lineup be because this team is stacked. Yeah, true. This team is stacked beyond belief. I know people want to like they love the dream team. This team's got better talent. There, every <sighs> yeah. every single position. There's no like people think about other teams that we've had before in the USA, they've been great players, but you had some like kind of bums on the back end of that roster. The worst player on the back end of this roster is a tie between drew holiday and Tyrese Halliburton. Who are really good. All stars, like third team, all NBA guys. You have, so for for the roster, you have Steph Tyrese Halliburton shooting guard. You have Devin Booker, Anthony Edwards, drew holiday, small forward, LeBron and Kawhi Leonard, Power forward slots, Anthony Davis, uh, Kevin Durant, Jason Tatum. At center, you have the rotation of Bam and Embiid. Also, you could still flex <laughs> Anthony Davis at center. Like, what are you going to do with this team? Like, it, like okay, here's my, here's my conspiracy theory. I think Noah Lyles is the biggest basketball fan ever and was tired of Team USA losing <laughs> and just took the fall for Team USA and became the scapegoat for everybody to be like, oh, they're chirping us now. Okay, we'll suit up now. Because I think this is like the first time that Curry has played for Team USA. Yes. And no, he's no, just like, in the, all in right, the Olympics. it's time to go. Oh, in the Olympics. Yes, he's played for Team USA and other stuff, but in the Olympics specifically. But this team is like ridiculous. Like the fact that 
our shooting guards are Devin Booker, Anthony Edwards, and Drew Holiday. Like, what do you do against them alone? Yeah. Because it's like, okay, you have one guy who is, like, incredibly consistent shooter all around in Devin Booker. Then you have Anthony Edwards, who is very young, incredibly aggressive on both sides of the floor. And then you have one of the better defenders in the league, Drew Holiday. Like, who, what do you do? two-time champion, like, knows how to get the job done. Yeah. Crazy. I think about this, like, God. think about the team this way. And obviously the U.S. has the best bas- basketball talent in the world. This started the whole Noah Lyles debate about, like, world champions and stuff like that. But when you look at other teams, you go, okay, you know, France is really good, right? They have Bam and they have, not Bam, they have Victor Rembignama and they have Rudy Gobert. That's really good. But who the hell is playing the other three positions? Like, power forward and center yeah. are great, but they don't have other talent elsewhere. So, yeah, they might give some work in the front court. They might find different ways, but you exceed the talent. Hey guys, Canada is really good. They got Jamal Murray. They got um, Shea Gilders Alexander, Dylan Brooks, or whatever. Who the hell is playing center? <laughs> who's who's guarding and beat? Yeah, exactly. Who's guarding and beat? Um, like, and that's like where this comes into play. With everyone's like, want to be like, eh, it's the other teams. They got some talent. No, no, no. They don't. They don't have what team like Team USA is deep at every position. Kawhi Leonard might not start. Yeah. Like that is ridiculous. Actually, I don't think he might not. He's probably not. He's probably not going to start. Like the fact that their six man is going to be Kawhi Leonard, literally one of the better defenders of all time. Yeah, he might not. He, like, he might not be the six man. He might be the seventh or eighth guy. Like this team is loaded. Because the thing I feel like is so different about this team specifically. Like I feel like in times past, like you know, we had like the redeem team and like, okay, like we have some like really good players and like in Olympics past, like, all right, we got like really good guys on offense. The defense on this team is ridiculous. Like, I feel like that alone is like probably their best attribute, which is so weird to say about team USA, but like every, it feels like in every position, everybody can play defense like minus like Steph, but like he doesn't really need to play that much defense. Because when you have somebody like Drew Holiday, Anthony Anthony Davis, like Kawhi Leonard, and then Embiid behind him at some point, it's like, who are you passing the ball to? Yep. Like every single other person is like locked up. So it's like, all right, you just have to try to get through Steph Curry, and it's like, okay, yeah, Steph Curry is not that good against NBA players. <laughs> He's playing against some guy from Lithuania. He's probably gonna be good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to pull up the starters for these teams. 2008 Redeem team. I mean, the roster depth is just unmatched in terms of, like, how deep the roster is. But even the starting lineup is... Like, the starting lineup for the 2008 Redeem team. Dwayne Wade. Steph's better than Dwayne. Toby Bryant. LeBron. Melo Dwight. Okay. Both Bam and Joel Embiid in my opinion, are better than Dwight Howard. So, that's, and Anthony Davis. I think Dwight's better than Bam, but not Embiid. Yeah. But that's fair. So they win the center battle. Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, I think they're better than Carmelo Anthony in 2008, especially in terms of like team basketball. Carmelo's a very ISO yeah. guy. LeBron is better in 2008 than he is now, but he's still LeBron. It's the same guy. And I just think the team gels so much better better together and you just can't yeah. defend them well so i guess the question is peter what's your starting lineup you gotta roll out five guys okay. on this team who you who you start oh my okay so it depends obviously it depends on the team whatever if we really just want to insult teams i think the funny well, okay, I, I wouldn't do this but what, what i'll go, do this what yes predict the start you'll first Pick what you think yes. the best team to go out with. When do the most games? Yes. You're assuming the starters play 36 minutes Absolutely. and you actually have regular yep. rotations. Yep. And then you go, what do you think they'll do? And then maybe like, what's the best for like setting media narratives? Oh, absolutely. So I think you're, I think, okay. So point guard has to be Steph, like period. I, in any situation, yep. it's going to be Steph. Um, then shooting guard, I think. Oh, it kind of depends. I think you go just, yeah, because if you're starter, I think you go Devin Booker just because he's very consistent. 
He's been very solid. Like, obviously, he's not like, like I say he's not a world beater. He's one of the better players in the NBA. But um, uh, small forward, you go LeBron, power forward. I would say, I would say Anthony Davis just because of his defense. Um, because, like, you know, you get guys like uh, – Devin Booker and Steph, they're not like great on defense. So if you have Anthony Davis in the middle alongside Joel Embiid, it's going to be ridiculous trying to get anywhere in the paint. So I think that's going to be their lineup is going to be Steph, Devin Booker, LeBron, AD, and Embiid. But I think the funniest lineup they could do would be if they went with Halliburton, because he's a lot taller than Steph, so he could probably play better defense. Then they go Drew Holiday, <laughs> and they go Kawhi, Anthony Davis, and then either a beat or bam, doesn't really matter, and just have the team score two points the entire game. <laughs> oh, wait, did your mic cut? Oh, no. Keep okay, rolling. there we go. Go. Um. The best lineup would be Steph, Drew Holiday, LeBron, Kevin Durant, and Joel Embiid, I think. Okay, and, so you're basically switching AD and Holiday in that lineup as, like, yeah. that's where the defense is coming from. I see. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the KD AD, do you think for me? You know what? I'm changing on the spot. Never mind. <laughs> I'm going Steph, Drew, LeBron, Jason Tatum, and Embiid. Whoa. Jason, is Jason, Jason is better at offense than Anthony Davis. He's worse at defense, but he's better at defense than Kevin Durant. That's what I would go if I'm trying to like win games. Because yeah, okay. I don't need my Devin Booker, Anthony Edwards, love those guys. I don't need them to score. I need yeah. a person who's gonna knock down threes, play good basketball, and be a good defender. Steph fantastic. Steph's fantastic. He's the best point guard. Um actually he's not probably the best point guard. He's probably behind Shea, so like he's not even the best point guard in the tournament yeah. at that point. LeBron, you have to put him there. Um, again, just hit him. If you're doing na- ma- media narratives, like you're trying to pump guys up, Steph, Anthony Edwards, who was reported saying that he is the number one option, that doesn't oh, change if he's on Team USA. <laughs> like he said that, um, which some people are making that not a big deal and be like, oh, he just got the dog in him. I don't know. I wouldn't really say that when you've got LeBron. I know it's like Anthony Edwards' edge. Yeah. I think maybe you say, hey, I might need to take a back seat this year because yeah. there's goats on your on your team anyway. Literally. But if you did Steph, Anthony Edwards, Jason Tatum at small forward, and then ran like Bam and Embiid, I think it would be like this really funny media-centric team. Yeah. And you'd be like, what is that? Um, <laughs> and you just like run it through. Or you can put like Devin Booker at the small forward or do something silly like that where it's like, oh, they're just playing for the future. Yeah. Um, the team I think they'll actually do is they're going to do Steph, Devin, LeBron, KD, and Embiid. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's the team they'll go with. Dude, could you imagine like you're like you're sitting on the bench for like whatever poor country they're playing in the first round, and like they sub you in, and they're like, okay, don't worry, their starters are coming out, and you look to see who's subbing in, and it's Kevin Durant, <laughs> like it's Kevin Durant, Drew Holiday, and Kawhi Leonard. <laughs> it's like, oh god, <laughs> like I teach math class. <laughs> It's this German guy who like teaches math and plays basketball on the side, and Kevin Durant to the scores table like, hey, like, congrats on making it this far. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, congrats, man. I'm gonna give you fifty. Yeah. That's it's like every every position. They have. Oh, did your mic cut again? Oh my god. We're just gonna keep rolling. We're just gonna keep rolling. Okay, just rip it. Um, yeah. But there, every position stat. I mean, if you go to the center position and just say AD is a center, they have Bam and Bead and Anthony Davis at center. So when they take out Victor and Rudy in game, like it's not like Victor. You're screwed. Victor yeah. France's advantage is they have Victor Wembanyama and Rudy Gobert to play in their center power forward rotation. 
and you can make an argument that no matter what lineup of center power forwards Team USA brings out, they're better than both of them. Yeah, it's like absolutely ridiculous. And then not to mention, it's like, okay, fine. You and Victor and Rudy both go out there at the same time. All right, cool. We'll just send Anthony Davis and jo- Joel Embiid out there. And then, oh, look who's coming off the bench. It's Bam out of bio. Oh, jo- <laughs> Joel got a little tired running running Victor around like the three-point line. All right, we'll put Bam in. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, all right. Like, usually with some of these teams, you got like some, like again, a bum kind of like hanging out there. So you're like, oh, okay. Like, you know, Jonas Valanciunas has to come in at center. Like, he's a good, yeah. he's a good player. He's better than most other people's teams, but he's not better than like, the other guy on the like mm-hmm. he's not better than the one a guy on the other team no they're all, they all are like yeah it's it's crazy and I, I like the hype around it because yeah i want them to succeed this year i want them to go out there you know get the gold medal and i want to see like, good basketball content i mean listen like all these guys being together they talk about the olympics like people get these thoughts in their head about who they want to play with and stuff like that um anthony edwards gets a little disgruntled in Minnesota, hey, is he talking? Is he chirping with some of these guys? Uh, Bam out of yeah. Bio, Miami Heat. There seems to be trouble in Paris. Does Bam start talking to like some guy like Devin? And it's like, you come to Miami, we could we could do something here. Yeah, you know, it make, makes it a little interesting. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And also, it's it's gonna be like because I think this team, especially too, it's such like good basketball because like everybody has like a very distinct position. And it's just going to be so cool to watch that because, like, Steph is, like, a shooter, but he is also a very good, like, playmaker. LeBron's also a very good playmaker. And, like, they'll be able to, like, kick out and have, like, a ton of assists. Like, I could literally see LeBron going out there, scoring zero points and having, like, 50 assists. (laughs) He's literally just throwing alley-oops and just, like, all right, everybody's getting the ball today. Yep. He might just do that at one game just to try it. Like, can I score? Why not? Can I score zero points? It's like how many assists can I get in a game? Let's see. Yep, I'm I'm stoked. It's like it's just it, I'm so it's, excited. It's so fun. The roster stacked, um, and I I'm excited for the Olympics. It's a good little hype up, and I'm just glad that the content yeah. is kind of rolled out there. Everybody's saying Embiid's a traitor. Stop saying it. I don't like the I don't like <laughs> I don't like the tweets. Cameroon was never making the Olympics and he could have played for <laughs> France, except he would have been on a team with Victor, Rudy, and himself. It made no sense. Also, I don't think I think he just speaks French. I don't know if he No, he is he, he has French citizenship. Oh, he does have French descent? Okay, okay, okay. But but you know what? Sucks. Every, He's everyone's ours. Everyone's like, oh, we could have done what Giannis did and like they play for his home country and get to the Olympics. It's Cameroon. Like no, dis- no disrespect to Cameroon, but I don't think anyone's been seeing them on the basketball scene lately. Joel Embiid was playing volleyball in Cameroon and only started playing JD yeah. basketball when he got to the states. Like there's, there's no basketball happening in Cameroon. His whole mission is to, like teach more kids in Cameroon how to play basketball because they don't know how to. So I don't know how he's expected. But to- again, it's it, they could then see him like on the like Team USA, and it's like, yeah, I'm from Cameroon. Yes. Like this is me playing basketball in the Olympics. Like. Guys, this is how like this is how international basketball started. Was the dream team? <laughs> like, yeah, you can't like like. I would love if Embiid could lead Cameroon, and you had that moment. You could see Giannis crying as he leads Team Greece yeah. to the Olympics. Like that's great because they had the, the talent there to get them there. Embiid would be bowing. Like I don't even know of any other Cameroonian basketball players to be like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, those would be on his team with him. There's yeah. Um, Matumbo was from. Uh, Cameroon, but Matumbo done retired twenty years ago, so <laughs> like he's not gonna play. So people need to stop yeah. calling my Pookie Bear Joel and be a traitor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're glorious, King. Yes. Anyway, that's episode thirty eight of the Coconut Curry Podcast. If you listen this far, thank you so much. If you could just do us a favor and leave a like, comment, subscribe, it really helps us out a lot. And other than that, we will see you next week on episode 39, where we break down the NFC South division. 